I'm Mark Babbitt, CEO and founder of U-Turn, and you are watching Eye on Business. I'm Kevin McDonald and you're watching Ion Business and tonight we have a real treat. Today we have Dave Burkus, Mr. Trend. He's not only known as Mr. Trend, he's known as one of the nation's most prolific investors. Dave has invested in well over a hundred companies. He sits on boards of many of them today. But more importantly, he shares his insights with the world in how it is that you start, grow, and successfully actually sell off a business because occasionally that's what you need to do. Thank you so much for coming in, Dave. I really appreciate it. Um, so the last time you were here, we talked about a lot of the, the uh, economic and the business trends in the world of technology. And you're famous for, for predicting and seeing what's coming in advance. So let's talk a little bit first about what's changed today from the last time you were in with us. Let's do that. First of all, Kevin, it's great to be back. Yeah, thank I you so much for coming. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, talking about trends is one of those great things that I love to do because here I am investing in some of these businesses and you really have to be three to five years ahead of where the other people see those businesses are coming yeah. to be able to make any money doing this in, in early stage investing. So uh, let's start for a second by talking about major trends and then get down to where those changes have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at cycles, uh, I'm really interested in the fact that there have been cycles that take about 50 years to play out all the way back to about 1781. And so if you really want to put this in the big picture, you'd say that the first cycle was uh, the invention of the steam engine. Because because of the steam engine, we were able to have all kinds of things we couldn't have before that allowed us to have automated factories. We could do things in the field that we couldn't do before. And for about 50 years, the steam engine was the principal technology driver. And those of us that could have invested back in then were great if we could have invested in the steam engine. Mm -hmm. And then there came a second wave, and that's the one that we really are first aware of, and that's the railway wave. Because if you can think of the steam engine inventing the fact that then we could have factories and we could begin to do things in the field better, with railroads, we could move those factories because they didn't have to be next to those populations that use the consumed products. Mm -hmm. And so my old industry was hotels. And just think about that. Hotels could never be further than too far or too close, I mean, to the people that they served. But then when you had the railways, hotels had to be all along the railroad, which meant all around the country. So that second wave happened around 1829. And that supported food and, and, and hotels and uh, fuel and everything that became with it as well. Cities were built, basically. Cheap along travel that. all along right. the railroads. Right. And so then around 1875, the third wave came, and that was the steel revolution. And we just can't underplay that. In, again, in my old industry, hotels never were higher than three or four stories because they were made of wood. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, we had these giant steel hotels, buildings, factories. And now you had railroads being able to deliver things from factories that might have been much larger than they were before. You had a cheaper delivery system. Mm -hmm. You had a cheaper system of manufacture because of the steam engine. And you had a cheaper system of uh, real estate because you had to use less property. Right. And so that was 1875. And then the fourth one, you can kind of guess yourself, and that was the mass production revolution. Yeah. We'll say that it began in 1908, but around that time when Ford developed the first assembly line. Mm -hmm. And now we had all the elements that we really needed to get to the next real revolution. And that's the one we're going to talk about. But I just wanted to give you that background. So, so let's so. touch on one thing, if we can, some of that background. Because from, from what I understand, every component of, or every one of those trends had something that initially financed it. And in the case of the railroad, it was oil, right? Um, oil Perfect and kerosene, said. right? Good for you, yes. So at what point um, in this most recent trend, if we can, what's helping to drive and finance that growth? Because we all know somebody has to pay for it. OK, so if you take the 50-year horizon, and we talked about the last one being 1908 to 1910, mm -hmm. I'll bend that a bit, because the horizon, the one I'm going to talk about now, which is the fifth wave, the one we're in today, mm -hmm. began in 1971. 1971, strange year to talk about. Yeah. But that was the industrial, or in our case, we'll call it the digital revolution. And people have called it by many names, but we're going to call it the digital revolution for the sake of this conversation. And if it's 50 years, and 1971, it's playing toward the end of this revolution right now. 
So as we talk today, we might be thinking about the sixth revolution and what it's going to be. And I'll have so do you think that, that, it, that it will involve, of course, it has to, to a degree anyway, involve a base of technology. But um, I've, con I've thought for a long time, I think it's going to be the inclusion of biologics in technology and the Getting advancement there. of, I mean, is that something we can predict a little bit and see in the future? Yeah, we can. And so let's now divide this new revolution that we're in now, the one that began in 1971, mm -hmm. and kind of figure out how that one is playing out, because that'll lead us to the question that you're asking. Okay. So if you look at the IBM mainframe, just the mainframe in general, because there were seven sisters that created the mainframe back in those days. That was around the 60s. Mm -hmm. And in the 60s, it was the generation of the mainframe. In the 70s, the mini computer came and, in essence, allowed small and medium-sized business to do the same thing that the very few, very large businesses could have done before. Yeah, my father was one of the people who bought one of the first Apples. We had the original you know, Apple Ones, Apple Twos, with the tape drive and the whole thing. Yeah, know. well, that would be the yeah. third of yeah. the decades. Right. So let's talk about that. So the mini computer revolution, allowing for thirty to fifty thousand dollar purchase prices, brought to the small businesses and the medium sized businesses the opportunity to act like mainframes. Mm -hmm. Then in the eighties came just what you're saying. It was the IBM PC, 81, 84, for the PC revolution that began because of it. Mm -hmm. The Apple around the same time, starting in 78, but really becoming popular in the early 80s as well. And so we had a revolution within a revolution, if you look at it that way. Mm -hmm. And then in the 90s, for the first time, we really looked at networks that were combining systems together to be able to do things in a much broader sense than just one or two or three Exponential machines. Exponential power of computers. So right. the 90s was the revolution of networking. And then in the 2000s, for the first time, we had a revolution that was really kind of interesting to me. It was the internet revolution. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly, we were networking without having to draw cable. Mm -hmm. And that was something that uh, was unique to us. And we all participated with that. So what's the one that's happening now? 90 made the revolution mobile. It was internet. It was mobile around the same time. Now, in the 2010 through 2020, the time we're going to concentrate on in this conversation, the real revolution today is wearables and mobile taking it the next step. And so we're going to be talking about how that works. So we went from giant mainframes, and there were very few of those in the 60s, to what well, we're going to talk about, the Internet of Things and the number of wearables that are out there and all of those things. So if I can sidetrack for number. one minute, I, I want to definitely go there. I think the Internet of Things and wearables are, are going to be a huge, and integratables, I think, in the long mm -hmm. run, biologically integrated. Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to step back for a second and say that I, as a person in technology, I'm actually seeing us moving back a little towards the mainframe concept, which is centralized computing. All you're doing is connecting a terminal. Yes, you're using the internet to do it. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's all in one big place instead of centralized thick computing in the environments. That Let's call this something a little different than the mainframe revolution, because mm -hmm. you're right. And it is one of the trends that we have to talk about, and that is to move toward the cloud. Mm -hmm. So the thing that you're calling the mainframe, as you just described it, is really some kind of a main processor, whether it be one processor or 10,000 like you see at yep. uh, Google or you would see at Amazon. Amazon yep. They're all acting as one, and they're in the cloud. Mm -hmm. They are completely remote, remote from us. We don't know they're there. And so we have to look at them as something that is a remote service, and that's one of those trends we'll talk about. So let's kind of look at these trends. Yeah, so let's start, then let's step back and let's get to mobile. Um, I call it the bring your own disaster trend, but um, because <laughs> <laughs> while it brings amazing power, it also brings, um, it actually is destroying the centralization that allows somebody like me, the security person, to be able to manage that process. But at the same time, it's an incredibly powerful thing. So how do we um, see that being able to play together, I guess? Yeah, I was going to draw you into this conversation because you're an expert in some of these areas about to talk about. Right. And I wanted to draw you in. Not quite yet. Okay. We get to that point Go one for step it. by one step. But it's interesting to see that uh, the way in which people react to these revolutions we just described mm -hmm. is always behind instead of in front. They really right. don't realize it's happened until it really has happened, which is good for mass appeal, but bad for us early adopters. Yes. We'll invest really early, and sometimes <laughs> we'll fall on our face because these things won't have really played out to the point where they've made any money until a decade after the time that we thought they would. Mm -hmm. And so there's a famous talk or a famous statement that was made by a French PhD who taught uh, in the French universities, and her name was Jean Gumchel. And she said, uh, no more fundamental, fundamental innovations are likely to be introduced to change the nature of today's society. We have reached the technological plateau. Oh, don't you love that? What year do you think she said that? Oh, God, it's got to be in the early 1900s. 
Well, no, she said that in 1974. Oh, okay. So that was the beginning of the revolution. Okay. She had no idea what was about to happen. I hit. know there was another comment in the early 1900s. Charles H. Duell there was the go. commissioner of patents yeah. in 1902, and he was looking at this vast survey of all the patents that he saw, and famously he said, everything that can't be invented has been invented. I love that. And we all love and that. And here we are today. And so now we can build upon those statements and really begin to talk about what's happening. So, we've so we have about, limited time. I want you to take this work in whatever direction you want to go. Let's mm -hmm. keep going down the trend line and, and you know what is next in your mind. Okay, so wearables has to be the first thing we have to talk about because mobile technology, we all have a cell phone. In fact, we all have a cell phone right yes. now. If there are seven million in the population, there are eight million cell phones out there right mm -hmm. now. You gotta say that many of us now, and this talks about the world population, many of us have more than one communicating device. Yeah. I have a cell, cell phone and a satellite phone and an iPad and I mean, you know, yeah, think about it. exactly so, that. I have five mobile subscriptions yeah, myself, yep. and then all the fixed subscriptions that you have of as well. Course. So it really is the beginning of saying that we are actually not just the people internet anymore. We are the internet of things. Mm -hmm. There are so many things attached to the internet now that we use daily. I have a Fitbit in my pocket, and I use that to measure the amount of exercise that I've had in steps and in calories and mm -hmm. in miles traveled and all the other things, and I pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And that Fitbit, which is an inch by a quarter of an inch, really tiny, reports to the internet next to any time that I'm next to any Bluetooth device, and then combines for me to tell me how well I'm doing daily, weekly, monthly, and uh, kind of helps me to set my regimen. It's an Internet of Things item. So there's some power to that, and, and I think in another show, I want to chat about the privacy implications of what's coming with the Internet of Things. And yeah, the ability to is. know where you are, what you're mm -hmm. doing, who's doing what, and all that. It's very interesting. But I don't want to go there today, but I do want to follow up with that later. Okay, uh, we'll mark the spot to do just that, <laughs> okay. because there's no way in this amount of time we can That's get right, to exactly. any of these trends in depth. So the ones that are really important, I said Fitbit. Fitbit's a wearable, mm -hmm. and it's a good example, and that's why I started with the example before mm -hmm. the trend. The number of wearables today is small compared to what they will be in two or three years. We're going to wear things. We're laughing today at the Apple Watch. We're laughing, we haven't seen it yet, we're laughing about what it might be. Samsung has a watch already, and some other manufacturers like Sony have already tried and pretty much failed. But then again, the first generation of anything of this type usually does. Yep. Google Glass, I'm hearing, is way below what expectations But it won't be. Yeah. Right. And we saw at the CES show, the Consumer Electronics Show in January, a couple of others that looked much, much more like integrated glass than Google does. Mm -hmm. But they all have a common thing, and that is bringing the technology to where you need it. Right. And that's the important where, thing. Where, when, and, and conveniently. Um, Darn right. And I like the whole thing about the hands-free um, concept of the wearables, because currently, you know, if you grab your phone and you, now you've lost the use of a hand, in some cases, too. You bet. Um, and the idea to be able to blink and interact or to... Communication and for information. Uh, at the Consumer Electronics Show this year, there were 3,300 exhibitors. There were 20,000 new products, which is just overwhelming. Oh, yeah. And there were 150,000 of us trying to see them all, of course, which right. is unbelievable as well. <laughs> but the bottom line was, for the first time, I was shocked to see that 9% of all the booths had something to do with e-health. Mm. And almost every one of the e-health items was a wearable. That's why I said that wearables has risen to be part of mobile, because that is a trend where you're using a remote communications method to get your information to and fro. Right. It still means that mobile has moved into a new universe that it never was in before. That's an interesting point, too, from as a health privacy and security expert. One of the things that I, I want to do is to see us adjust the legislation and regulations that are going to free up a little bit more of this and not be so concerned. Privacy is important, but people are so concerned about privacy, there are so many powerful things that aren't going to happen. You are right. Um, and we need to figure out a way to loosen it up without releasing the, the dragon, I guess would be the way to put it. Well, when we talk about wearables reporting to somebody and how do you control who that somebody is, everything about our health and, and everything about what we are, where we are, where we are, mm -hmm. and how we are, both how we are feeling and how we are in health, that becomes a major privacy issue that you'd like to keep for yourself and perhaps for your physician. But it really is something that is going through the Internet in a place that is very, very accessible. Yes. So that is a conversation we can have. So I have about three minutes left, and I don't want to pass this up. Mm -hmm. um, I said Dave was a prolific writer, and I can't <laughs> begin to go through, but I really hope that you'll search for Dave Burkus. That's B-E-R-K-U-S. Um, Here's one on the basics of Bur Burkonomics, and it's 100 powerful insights for starting, growing, a successful, um, and successfully exiting your entrepreneurial business. Exiting is a really important point, but more importantly, Dave writes on a regular basis, and 
he did not come here to hawk books. This is my way of saying the man knows what he's talking about, and you really should look at what he has. We have about three minutes, two and a half minutes left. Sure, Kevin. Let's let you tell me um, where do you think the best trends in mobile are going to be in that wearable environment? So what, what component or segment of wearables do you see being the biggest? Absolutely two and only two for the first generation. And the ones, uh, the first generation probably is this next five years as it plays out. E-health, we're all going to be more concerned and more aware of our health because of these tiny devices. Uh, I have already changed my health habits just because of these tiny devices. Mm -hmm. I wear it when I sleep. I can tell because it reports to me how many hours I was, or minutes, I was restless, how many times I woke up, wow. and it tells me how many minutes or hours I slept, and then compares it to my averages, my past, mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly I began to be aware that, you know, if you lose sleep and you don't feel well because of it, you know why, mm -hmm. not just mm -hmm. the fact that you had it happen. So wearable health is going to be a gigantic trend. Wearable information, you gave the good example. You don't want to have to pull out your cell phone. Mm -hmm. Not that we're lazy, but it's distracting. Mm -hmm. And so communications and health are the two places in wearable that will make that gigantic change. There are lots of other trends. It's so much fun to talk about them. It would take several shows for us to do it. Let me just name them, if nothing else, just to whet your Please appetite. Please do. Nothing else. So one of the gigantic trends today is the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. There are so many devices today, maybe... Perhaps we say that there are 8 to 10 million devices today that are reporting to the Internet on a regular basis, not cell phones, other kinds of right. devices. And the things that they're reporting, we used to laugh about, too, like your refrigerator telling you that you needed milk. Right. Well, we're not laughing about that anymore no, because it's are. a reality. Yeah. But the number of devices are, if you listen to Cisco, going to be 50 million by 2020. If you listen to some of the other people, they're going to be 80 million to 100 million reportable devices that are actually talking to you over the internet. I said million, I meant billion. Billion, I was going to say, yeah. I was going to add a B, I didn't want to correct you, but, you, but it's, okay, it's going to be in the billions. It's such sure. a giant number, it's almost hard for us to believe. Right. But when you start looking around your home today, you begin to see that already, innocent and young as we are, we're reusing the I saw a fascinating watch. thing, and I know this is kind of silly, but um, medical bottles with a timer on top. Oh. that actually has a blue, uh, what do you call it, a Bluetooth connection to a computer, and it tells the doctor when you take your pill or, or whether you didn't, um, and the time in between. I mean, to me, it's such a simple thing, but what an awesome improvement in somebody that may have cognitive issues or just maybe like me, they're distracted, and, and you, it, it talks to you, and it'll even send a warning to your phone, hey, you're due to take your pill, or you have to eat 30 minutes before you take your pill, and it tells you time to eat. This is just amazing stuff. So the entrepreneur behind that bottle approached me at oh, the uh, National okay. Angel Conference years ago, and he gave me a sample of the bottle. Yes. And he said, I have something that will change the world. And I said, well, I'm happy to see that, and I really want to see you do this. You don't happen to be in Southern California, so I'm not really going to focus upon you, which is my problem. So I have stories of deals that I have lost over the years because I really wanted to have a local focus for where I happen to be mm -hmm. in my own business. Well, that's okay because you do. I know you're deeply involved and you actually are, are physically and emotionally a participant and, and, and constantly involved. You're not just throwing money passively at these things. So I could see why that would make sense for you to stay local, but I'm sure you have missed a few boats. Yeah, I have that famous story of having missed Amazon in its uh, second generation back when the angel money was being regenerated in the second round. And I have an, I have an email from an old employee of Oof. mine who left me and five years later showed up as employee number seven at Amazon. Wow. And I like to read that email sometimes just to remind myself. Uh, what you missed, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, there, there's all of those opportunities. So I'm going to say this. We definitely want to have you back. Sure. Um, in fact, I'd like to pull you back maybe on some segments um, to allow you to discuss the specifics. Building great boards, starting up, <laughs> cashing out, growing your business, managing your workforce, many more. <laughs> thank you so, so much for coming in, Dave. Yeah, I appreciate it. I am Kevin McDonald, and you've been watching Ion Business, and with me today has been Dave Burkus, Mr. Trend. We hope you'll keep watching. Thank you. Well, welcome to the Burkus Report. This is the very first time that we've had a report such as this, and I'm very happy and enthused to be able to share with you ideas for entrepreneurs and for business people that I hope that you can use over the years. 
I've written about this for years now in books called Burkonomics. And what I've done in these writings is to try and encapsulate stories of entrepreneurs who have succeeded wildly, who have failed <laughs> wildly as well, and try and develop lessons from each one of those. And since I've been doing this since 1993, I have hundreds of these lessons that I've written about. So that's what we'll do in the Burkes Report. You and I will talk about things that I hope that you can take away the same lessons that I'm trying to give you about some of these things. So let's pick just two of them for this first Burkes Report edition. The first is something taught to me by one of the CEOs that I had helped to finance in the company that uh, we just sold after 12 years, just this last year. And the CEO said, you know, there are three things we like to measure as we relate to almost any business. And you can remember them very easily with three letters. The letters are A, M, D. And it's true of all of us in almost every business we have. The A is accumulate as many different ways to price your product to the various kinds of constituents that you're going to sell it to. Or accumulate as many different products if you're a retailer to be of interest to your customers. But accumulate so you're not just selling one product at one price. Then there is M. If you're a retailer, that means merchandising. And if you're anybody else, it really means marketing. And to be able to market well whatever you have is the skill that helps you develop a broad marketplace for whatever products that you now have in that arsenal of products that you developed, M. And D, you may not have ever thought about this, but if you distribute through only one source, one retail website, for example, one store, your chances of exposure are really not very good. And so if you find multiple places where you have multiple outlets, whether they be virtual by the internet or whether they be real by stores, your opportunities are multiply much better. So AMD, accumulate more ways to sell your product and products to sell. M, market or merchandise them well and in many different channels if you can. And D, distribute them in as many places as you can. AMD, pretty easy to remember, right? So I have another story that I love to tell. You know I finance entrepreneurs, and I've been doing this since 1993, and I've financed hundreds of entrepreneurs. I coach many of them. That's a joy that I have. But sometimes some strange twists happen, and I'm going to tell you a twist as the second and last story for today. I had a chief programmer in a company that I was running myself, and I saw him leave me in 1990. And he left because he didn't want to be a chief programmer with 26 employees. He wanted to be a marketing person. And in his wisdom, and he was wise, he said, I had some ideas. And I said to him, but Tom, his name, Tom, you are responsible for thousands of hotels and their computer systems, and you're responsible for 26 employees who report to you. I just can't have you be a marketing person. And he left me. And he sold his home in Orange County, California, at the height, at one of those heights that happens over time. And he left. And five years later, I received an email. You know, this is many years after that. And I keep that email today with me. I keep it wherever I go. I know you'll think that's a little strange, but I'm going to pull out a copy of that email right now. I actually have the original under glass. This is a true copy of the email from Tom five years after he left me. The date was August 26, 1995. And it starts with, hello again, Dave. After looking around rather a lot, I've ended up as employee number seven at a retail Seattle internet startup called Amazon.com. Tom was the head of marketing at Amazon. And I told him that I couldn't have him be a marketing person. And he told me in the middle of this email how at 1 o'clock every day, he, Jeff, and the other five stop, and they pack the books, getting them ready for the post office, and then they go back to work. And Tom, this is not part of the email, was the one who invented the affiliate program for Amazon. Hundreds of thousands of people pointing toward Amazon so that they received a small commission for books that were posed from their website. And he said, I'm looking at my stock options and I'm counting the days. You really ought to see what, I'm, what we're looking at. The founder is in round two of capital seeking. And if I had the minimum 100,000, I'd buy in this from a cautious, unnaturally dubious insider. If you'd like me to introduce you to him, I'm sure he would take your money. Sincerely, Tom. And I wrote him back. And I said, gee, Tom, great to hear from you. Keep me informed. Well, I'm going to ask you the question that I know that you're a little further away from me than somebody who can answer, but I'm going to ask you the question anyway. What do you think that 100000 would have been worth had I been making that investment? Two years later at their public offering in 1997, I have to give you the answer because you can't tell me from where you are. The answer was $33 million. 
Now let's say that I held on to it for one year more, because you have to hold on to it for six months. It's one of those rules for private investors. One year after the date, it would have been the middle of 1998. What would that 100000 have been worth? And the answer is $66 million. And my answer was, Tom, keep me informed. And what's the lesson out of that one? The lesson out of that one is some of these are going to get away. Some of those opportunities for you and me in business and investing are going to get away. And we have to know that the only thing we can do is to just laugh at them because they're going to happen. So there's my lesson for the day. Smile at your successes and laugh at your failures. This is Dave. Well, thanks for watching. This was the very first Perkis Report on Ion Business. Perfect.